Hello, hello. Welcome to One Wild World, a podcast by The Echo. I'm your host, Matthew Juno, And I'm the editor, Mike Davis. Mike, when you think of iconic partnerships, what comes to mind? Hmm. I mean, like off the top of my head, probably peanut butter and jelly, fish and chips, cookies and milk, burger and fries. Man, I must be hungry right now. Yeah, it sounds like you might need to make a snack after this. Well, at the heart of the work that's being done by today's guest is a partnership just as strong as all of those food combinations. What's the partnership? So today's guest works for Climbers for Bat Conservation, which, as the name implies, is a partnership between rock climbers and bat biologists. So the idea was that bats roost in really hard-to-reach places like sides of cliffs, caves, up in tops of trees. And these are all really hard places for biologists to get to to study bats. But who can reach there are rock climbers. So this collaboration was formed to help benefit both groups. I love that this collaboration exists because climbers get to participate in a really cool study, while bat biologists get to benefit from an expanded set of data. Yet another example of the many unique ways that collaborations naturally arise in the world of working with animals. Totally. That's why a platform like this podcast helps us highlight collaborations between people and animals all over the world. Truly one wild world, if you ask me. Truly. Now, before we jump into the conversation, it's time to put on your animal detective hats and play another round of What's That? Okay, round one may have been a bit too easy, so today I'm really stepping up my game. To explain the rules again, I'm going to play the sound that an animal makes, and it's up to you to try to figure out which type of animal it is. So here we go. I told you, I'm really stepping up my game. If you think you already know the animal, I encourage you to think about the setting for why this animal made that noise. One more time for everyone, here's the sound. Okay, I feel good that I'm really going to trick some of you this time around. If you're looking for a hint, remember that this season, the animal sounds are all related to the guests that we have. In fact, the audio that we're playing is from the research that's done by our guest, Rob Shore, and his collaborative work that we mentioned before. Rob is a zoologist, conservation biologist, and the director of Climbers for Bat Conservation. Now, our conversation with Rob Shore. Can you quickly take us through the history of Climbers for Bat Conservation and how that partnership started and then how it's going currently? Sure. Sure. For those who aren't familiar with the program, the Climate for Bat Conservation Project is a collaboration between bat biologists, recreational climbers, and land managers to learn more about where bats roost on cliff faces. That's kind of how it started, but now we're learning about bats in a whole host of rock structures from rock climbers and other recreationists. Back in 2013-14, I was working with a conservation botanist who hired climbers to survey for plants along the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. When I was describing to her how we really need to know where bat populations are, she gave the plug saying, you know what, you really need to know more about what climbers see. And she mentioned a website called Mountain Project, which is a social media site for recreational climbers to talk about climbs and the difficulty of those climbs, and they commonly report seeing bats. And so that got the wheels turning, and we sat down and discussed, hey, wouldn't this be a cool idea to learn from climbers about where bats roost? Because it's information that we as bat biologists have always wanted to know but we didn't have the talents to be up on cliff faces to enter and engage with them. And we never knew how often people encountered bats. They all liked the idea, and we pitched it to the School of Global Environmental Sustainability at CSU, and they gave us enough seed money to host a couple of formal sit-down meetings with climbers, biologists, and land managers to say, hey, is this an idea that the climbing community and the land managers would get behind? And we were skeptical only because we didn't know how much climbers would be interested in sharing information about where they see bats for fear that that information might prevent them from getting access again. What we found out is that climbers love the idea. 
is that they were all on board from that small group of people that we had pulled together and they designed our logo they were the ones that said you need to get the media presence websites social media so yeah now i manage social media sites and it's well outside of my expertise and it was because of their excitement is that it really pushed the program along so fast forward six seven years and right now we have contributions of data from seven countries as far away as bulgaria norway kenya where climbers have seen bats in cracks and it's great information for us learning about how they use these systems, but it's also a great resource for us finding out where large populations reside. So if we need to monitor them in the future with threats like new disease white nose syndrome comes through the U.S., as we know where some of those populations exist, and we can go back there sometimes with climbers' help and monitor them. Excellent. The ECHO and Climbers for Bat Conservation have had a good history together. And anytime that I'm out climbing myself or get the chance to talk about Climbers for Bat Conservation, it's such an easy thing to describe because bats have this reputation for roosting in really hard to reach places like up in trees on the sides of cliff faces and caves. Your everyday scientist doesn't have the ability to like get up there and study those. And so who does have the ability to get up on these cliff faces? That's climbers. And so this is just such a natural partnership. One thing that I was curious about with what you just said was you've gotten data from all over the world. Has there been any information that has surprised you about where bats are roosting or the environments that they're choosing? You're talking to somebody who's vertically challenged and my experience in climbing is relatively recent. So it all surprises me to see where climbers see bats. Some of the ones that surprised me though, weren't necessarily where they were, but what species. So we started getting photographs from climbers of bats on cliff walls from certain bats that we typically describe as migratory tree bats. Bats we commonly associated with an affinity for roosting in foliage or on trees. Well, climbers were seeing those on cliff faces, and it shouldn't shock us that they'll use those, but to see their pelage patterns or fur patterns camouflaged on rock, it makes perfect sense is that they're hardly visible at some times. And so it's really interesting to learn how these species we thought we understood, we might be learning more about how they use habitats from the observations that climbers provide. I'm always blown away by what climbers are providing to us. And some of the best documented occurrences of this come from very famous climbers, Alex Honhol, climbing El Capitan, being thousands of feet off of the surface, finding bats pouring out of cracks. They've been seeing these emergences of hundreds of bats for years. And so I'm still blown away by experiencing that kind of proximity to a population and knowing that they've been living there for years. It does truly surprise me where I've seen bats because I live in the city. And so you'll see bats at little parks or flying around at night. But there was one time I was climbing Long's Peak in Rocky Mountain National Park here in Colorado. And I was within the last mile, which is where you essentially start to summit the really steep part of the mountain. And there were bats flying around Wow. Up, at, up at like 12,000 to 14,000 feet of elevation, just cruising around. And it's super early in the morning. Bats, I think, have a reputation for being hard to study in general. They're the only mammals that can fly. They're out at night. None of that makes it easy. Again, they roost on cliff faces, caves, and trees. So, And you can't listen for them. They're vocalizing in ultrasound. And so it's another thing that keeps our observation of them at a limited capacity. You've actually mentioned before that everyday people can kind of appreciate bats, and that's by using an app, right? Mm -hmm. For most everyone to easily observe bats is a real challenge. I mean, I got interested in studying bats simply because it was that first encounter of being next to them and observing them that was pretty infectious. So there are ways of observing them that are pretty easy maybe not visually, but acoustically, they now make an app, a little device that you can plug into your smartphone. It's an ultrasonic microphone. So it allows you to listen to and even record ultrasound onto your phone. And the app allows you to identify which species of bats those are flying around based on the sonogram of that ultrasound. Yeah, I didn't know that that app was even able to tell you which kind of bat species is flying around near you. 
it gives you a good hint. There are a couple of bats that they overlap in how they use ultrasound. And so it, it won't always tell you who it is because it doesn't quite know, but there are some bats that are really distinct in their vocalization patterns and it'll identify those pretty readily. It's not particularly expensive. I think they're somewhere around $200. But if you don't have that technology, a great place for viewing bats, our largest colony is uh, Mexican free-tailed bats, Brazilian free-tailed bats down in the San Luis Valley at the Orient Mine. So it's on the east side of the valley there, and they have emerged for decades over the Central Valley, probably hunting the insect population over those agricultural fields for the longest time. Within Colorado, how many bat species are there? Ooh, good question. I've guesstimated there's about 20. And the reason that's a guesstimate is because there are a couple of species that are just at the fringes of Colorado's border. And with bats being so difficult to detect, there's nothing to say they haven't been flying in sections of Colorado, we just haven't detected them. So there's one species just outside of the eastern boundary of Colorado near Oklahoma and Kansas that we haven't quite documented. There's another one in the southwestern part. One of the bat species in Colorado has only been documented based on its ultrasonic vocalizations. It wasn't until they finally found a roadkill specimen that they could physically document being in Colorado. But recording the ultrasound, they knew it from the southwestern part of the state for a while, but they just could not catch it. Kind of going off of that, within the whole group of mammals, rodents have the largest amount of diversity in species. But the next group with the highest amount of diversity is bats in the order of Chiroptera. And so people think that there's only little tiny bats and then fruit bats, but there's so many different types. There's orange bats. There's ones that have spots like cows. There are the huge ones that look like flying foxes. Within Colorado, what does that diversity of bats look like? Compared to the 1,400 species there are in the world, in Colorado, it's pretty restricted. And they are typically of two major families here in Colorado, almost entirely insectivorous. There is one species we know that will periodically feed on nectar or pollen. It's the pallid bat, but we just don't know to what degree they're doing that as part of the regular diet. So the size range in Colorado can be anywhere from a ruler long to the length of my finger long, as far as wingspan. They can be really tiny in Colorado and relatively large. But as far as the grand diversity that we see here in the U.S. in particular, it can be relatively restricted just because you do have flying foxes that are the wingspan of my arm, six feet, down to things that are the size of a penny, like a bumblebee bat. Yeah, bats are one of the animals, the more you learn about bats, the more fascinating they get. I mean, there's vampire bats that don't actually drink blood the way that movies portray them. It's much more like they make a small incision that has a numbing effect from their saliva, and then they just lick the blood up. But they are feeding off of blood. There's ones who fish. There are bats who will make tents out of leaves. So they'll systematically go under the leaf of a plant and tiny little bites as they're going across and it'll make a tent structure. So bats are just amazing. You know, they've been around a long time and they've figured out how to make a living out of sometimes eating the oddest things. And you're right, you mentioned probably the most notorious stories that exist for bats and that's vampire related horror films. To try and dispel that toxic image, you're right, is that the vampire bats, and there's three species. They don't suck blood, and they typically make such a fine incision in what they're lapping blood up from, quite often the animal doesn't even know. But to live off blood is quite a challenging existence. But you hint at the variety of things that they eat. Some have keyed in on how frogs sing, on the vocalization that frogs made in mating calls to identify them. The fishing one that you mentioned, they've picked up on the ripples that fish can make in pools to track down where the fish is going to be and they drag their feet through the water and pick them up that way and there's pollen and there's nectar the story i typically tell most to get excited about bat conservation or interest in bats is that tequila only exists because of bats the primary pollinator for agave plants are bats and it's these big flowers with big corollas and these bats put almost their entire body in there and pollinate other agave but then they come out looking yellow, dusted, flying <laughs> through the desert. So there you go, viewers. Next time you want to appreciate bats, you can have a margarita and know that your tequila was sourced from a bat. 
with the pop culture return of Batman to the movies with Robert Pattinson, do you think that has an impact on real bats at all? Or do you ever in Climbers for Bat Conservation lean into the fact that a new Batman movie is coming out and trying to do something with that? Whether we decide to lean into it or not, it's just how the public has become familiar with bats. And so with that in popular culture right now, it's tough not to have that mentioned when it comes up. I don't typically lean into it as much because it's still a dark figure and that hero exists in a secretive environment. The last thing that we need for bat conservation is to try and make them seem more mysterious. What we do, and you're helping me do that, is talk about the wonders of bats and how they're important for ecosystems and human health. The vampire bats you mentioned, they've capitalized on their saliva's ability to prevent coagulation clotting of blood, and they've used that in heart patients. And so telling those stories, rather than the ones that center around this dark, mysterious figure fighting evil is is one that I tend to lean in more. Probably as you should be. Are there any other misconceptions that you know about? Ton. They get in your hair. They all carry rabies. Yeah, that was going to be one that I was going to talk about is I worked as a wildlife biologist around city of Denver and We do often hear that like, oh, well, you got to be careful about interacting with bats because you can get rabies and you can. But I think that number is really inflated because the bats who do get rabies are sick. They're not healthy. And so they're going to end up on the ground where as a human, you are way more likely to interact with them. And you're not seeing the population of bats that's actually around you that doesn't have rabies. And so there's a misconception there that all bats have rabies when in actuality it's less. You just told the story. That's exactly it, is all the ones we interact with are only sick ones. And so the rate of rabies is inflated because we never get access to the ones that are flying around that are healthy. So they estimate there's probably less than 1% of the population that carry rabies. What would you say are some of your best successes with climbers for bat conservation? The success that I tend to really celebrate is the enthusiasm we get from climbers about the project. I've always been very respectful about climbers wanting access to the areas that they want to recreate because one is that recreation is a huge value for appreciating the outdoors. And two is that they're an information resource for understanding where a bat's roost. The second part of the success though, is that in celebrating their data contributions and their excitement for the program is actually looking at the data contribution. There's no way that I would have records from Kenya and Sweden and Norway if it wasn't through the word of mouth from climbers. I'm not out there talking in these regions. It's only because climbers are talking about the project and they want to support it that other climbers are finding out in different parts of the world. So if there's a subset of our viewers who are climbers, what kind of data are you interested in from those climbers when they're going out? Well, thankfully, it's a lot of the details that climbers know really well. You climb, I climb. When you climb up a rock structure, you're very aware of heights. (laughs) So what heights are you seeing bats at? What are the dimensions of the cracks the bats are residing in? What direction are those cliff faces facing? We found that some bats are regularly found on south facing flakes. And for the viewers that don't know the climbing terminology, a flake is where a crack goes into the rock structure. So we found them in these thin flakes that are south facing the sun is just beating down on these. It gets really hot. We found out breeding females like it hot because the pups like it that warm. And so climbers are really familiar with these structures. We don't really care if you can identify the species of bats because it usually takes me having a host of them in hand to know what species I'm dealing with. They're just not easy to tell apart. Sometimes we're looking at teeth. Sometimes we're looking at feet. It's just, we don't want anybody handling bats. And we prefer people not get close enough that they would ever get bitten, though that can't happen. But most of the data that we want are related to the structures of where the bats are. How many they see, what's the crack structure look like, how wide, how long. Most of the details that climbers are really familiar with. And that's enough that it gives us information for where we can start predicting in the future where we might look for bats. But also, if there's a big population there, it's a place that we know we should return to. And then is there a place, if you see a bat and you have all of this data that you want that data to be sent? Is it a website or an app or an email? So we'll have a whole page on our website dedicated to data contribution. It's going to be a geographic information system that allows projecting data in a map environment. And it has those questions that we ask for them. 
and then it'll project on a map so that all the climbers, back biologists, and land managers can see who's contributed the data. It even allows a place for climbers to submit pictures because one of the most engaging parts of this is you start seeing what climbers see and it blows you away. We've gotten videos that I'm just ecstatic about the intimacy they get to see populations. When I survey for bats and I can't get them, they're viewing them right next to them. So yes, we will have that as part of our website. You do a really good job of sharing when people send in photos, kind of giving them credit of like, hey, thanks person X from doing this climb. And then you'll share that photo or usually a couple photos and one will be the bat image that they took. And then it'll also have a picture of them climbing on that route. And so it's a really engaging Instagram to not only see some of the places humans are capable of getting to, but then also the tiny little cracks and crevices that bats are able to squeeze into. What conflicts do you face with climbers for bat conservation? Good question. I think I've alluded to the one I expected right from the get-go. And as that was, as climbers have provided data, that I was sure they would be fearful that that's going to be used to keep them from routes. That hasn't been the case. There's always that level of skepticism with any recreational user group. They need data that they provide could then make it more difficult. So there's still some low level of that. But what we found is an overwhelming excitement from the climbing community about participating in this to think they can play a role in that conservation. So that was the one I expected the most, but thankfully hasn't been all that problematic. So what we've done then is we've started partnering with climbing organizations like Access Fund and bat conservation organizations like Bat Conservation International to collaboratively work on climbing management documents that help guide how climbers can think about their activities in relation to bats. This collaborative co-authoring of conservation documents really solidifies the partnership even larger. I mean, partnering with Access Fund was one of the biggest ventures we had for gaining respect within the climbing community. And then we got a grant from Petzl to help us print t-shirts that we reward climbers who tell us where they see bats with a free t-shirt. We're still going to try and do that as often as we possibly can by celebrating the artwork the climbers provide us. The first artwork was done by a climber and a bat biologist. But our next one, we're going to have done by another artist here shortly. Nice. And I'll say that Climbers for Bat Conservation shirt is very, very comfortable. When laundry's all wrapped up and I have a fresh row of t-shirts, that's one of my go-to shirts. So very clear and visible. Always be networking. <laughs> what are the best ways for viewers to support Climbers for Bat Conservation and the work that you're doing? The biggest request that I have for supporting the kind of work we do is to have everybody talk about the same advantages and values that bats provide. So the ecological value in eating insects, limiting pests, potentially playing a role in limiting insect disease carriers, their value in pollination, there's a whole host of fruits that they play a role in pollinating sharing those messages of their conservation value and supporting the work we do. If you're a climber and you know other climbers, sharing our project with them and relating those values and explaining to them why it's important for us to understand how bats exist along cliff systems, that's the next piece. We're still trying to develop a formal way of accepting donations as part of Colorado State University, but eventually we'll have some capacity to do that as well. But right now it's mainly just spreading the word of the value of bats and why we should care. Wonderful. Well, Rob, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was great to talk with you about not only bats and pop culture, but climbers for bat conservation and get an appreciation for it. Thanks so much for taking the time and speaking with us. Thank you. You know, for those who aren't familiar with your and my long history is that you were instrumental in providing our program to an audience early on, back when you were an undergraduate. So yeah, I, I always look forward to these kind of conversations in part because I really value the kind of work that you do in communicating the science that we do. That's one of the things that we have to get better at doing is sharing our work with the public, but also because it's a neat environment to discuss these issues. And our conversations are just, they're fun. It's like catching up with an old friend and you're right. The stream that is the echo and climbers for bat conservation often intertwine and support each other. So thanks again for being part of it. Climbers for Bat Conservation has been an organization that we've kept our eye on over the last few years, and it's been great to see them have so much success, 
Again, it's such a smart collaboration and a great way to engage people with wildlife conservation who might not have known they ever could be. You know what's another great collaboration? Us here at One Wild World and you, the listener. Thanks for sticking around. So now it's time to reveal the answer to what's that animal? One more time. Here's the sound. Okay, lock in those final guesses. The answer is that this is a bat, specifically a little brown bat, the scientific name Myotis lucifugus. Rob had captured this bat for research, and it's actually a slow motion video of the bat being released. I'm hoping that some of you may have thought that this was the bat's echolocation, but those calls are actually produced at ultrasonic frequencies outside of the range of human hearing. However, bats do make a variety of noises, and these were some of the clicks that bats make that we can hear. Tune in to the next episode for another chance to play What's That Animal? If you enjoyed this conversation, subscribe and consider supporting us directly at patreon.com slash one wild podcast. Here you'll find exclusive content like the full video versions of our conversations. To find out more about the other work we do, visit our website at onewildpodcast.com. Follow us on Instagram at The Echo Animals and follow our TikTok at creature.feature. On behalf of all animals, thank you for listening. <laughs>